Oui, vous enregistrez. Oui, vous enregistrez. Très bien. Ignorez maintenant. OK. OK, OK. Bon. Let's begin. Let's begin. Yes. Uh, so, thank you so much uh, um, for being there uh, in remote uh, and uh, uh, in presence. Uh, I'm really delighted to, to present uh, Catherine Bactil, you already know, I think, because she's a very active uh, semiotician, uh, not only in biosemiotics, but in image theory, in uh, general semiotics, and so on. Catherine Bactil is adjunct professor at the Institute of Cultural Studies at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, in Poland. She's a very active semiotician who has a large spectrum of research interests, such as the anthropological conceptualizations of culture-nature relations, especially the theory of Bruno Latour and Tim Ingold, who are two scholars that are really uh, discussed in semiotics. She has written several texts on biosemiotics, existential semiotics, and general semiotics theory, with a special regard to issues such as the subject and its environment, agency, about what she will talk today. In uh, 2017, she published a book in Polish entitled Semiotics of the Image, Representations and Objects, She's preparing a new personal book uh, which deals with the theory of subject, agency, action, choice, body, from the point of view of cultural semiotics uh, by Lotman, biosemiotics by Kalidikul and Sienfeld, existential semiotics, special Tarasti's work, and uh, of uh, before mentioned uh, anthropology. Uh, the one of uh, Ingold and Latour as well. So I'm really glad to give you the floor for the conference uh, entitled Non-Human Artists, Biosemiotics, Art and Design. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Maria, for this very kind introduction. Thank you once again. Thank you to all the audience who is there uh, remotely. And uh, let me start. Here is the uh, title slide of my talk, Maria has already said the title of it, so let me just skip to the second uh, slide in which you can just see the main points I would like to discuss during my talk. Uh, so let's start with the introduction. The basis of my considerations proposed in this talk is the juxtaposition of two theoretical perspectives, biosemiotic and anthropological. Reference is made to the findings from the field of biosemiotics. Here I have in mind especially the concept of Jakun von Uxkul and Kalev Kuhl, as well as the authors referring to biosemiotics, like Susan Petrilli and Paul Cobley, and from the field of anthropology, which is Tim Ingold. This will allow us to obtain an appropriately complex theoretical background for the presentation of the main research problem of this talk, that is, the issue of agency, dwelling and living, with particular reference to art and design. This juxtaposition may seem a little bit risky, especially when one considers Ingold's clearly state approach to semiotics. Quote, in one memorable encounter some years ago, Philip de Scola branded me as a semiophobe. It is a badge I am proud to wear, end of quotation. However, as I will try to show, this risk seems to pay off. It is encouraged above, above all by the fact that the anthropologist refers to an absolutely basic concept within biosemiotics, that is to exclude Umwelt in the context of building and dwelling. Theoretically, therefore, in my talk, I propose to juxtapose the biosemiotic and anthropological perspectives, of course, in the limited dimension outline above, while in terms of the subject matter, I focus my considerations on the problems of building, dwelling, art and design. In order to do so, I will first shortly introduce the theoretical concepts necessary for further considerations, such as the non-anthropocentric inclination of biosemiotics, the notion of the biosphere, and finally, Ingold's anthropological approach. 
This will allow me to move on to the next issue, which is subjectivity and agency considered against the backdrop of the previously discussed theories. The last part consists of the so-called case studies. I will look at the artistic project Zoepolis, which addresses the issue of agency among animate and inanimate nature, and what is particularly important, dwelling. Moreover, it is also worth mentioning that it addresses the problem of essentiality and anthropo anthropocentric division between weeds and useful plants, and between pests and useful animals. This leads the creators to propose a non-anthropocentric design, taking into account the subjectivity of all beings and the ethical dimension. The project is an artistic one on the borderline of humanities, natural sciences and art, thus combining three seemingly inconcilable spheres and addressing the issues of natural subjects' agency and dwelling. The second case study is Diana Lelonek Herbarium Waste Plants Atlas. It presents the effects of human activity on certain species and plants. Uh, of plants, I'm sorry. Landfills and post-industrial slag heaps are the spaces Lelonek is fascinated with the most. She is interested in plants' capacity to adapt to a new, unnatural environment and, as a result, to create so-called hybrid waste plants. Post-human material has thus become a home for non-human species. Okay, now I'm in the right slide. Uh, so, the first main point beyond anthropocentrism, general semiotics, biosemiotics and semiobiosphere. What connects the biosemiotic approach with Ingold's anthropology is, above all, the non-anthropocentric perspective and, consequently, the assumption that the inseparability of nature and culture. As Paul Cobley notes, the task of biosemiotics is, quote, to make more porous the boundary between living nature and culture, the sciences and the humanities. As such, it is a challenge to the view of human, humans as exceptional in nature, end of quotation. Note that biosemiotics simultaneously crosses the boundary between nature and culture on the plan of ontology and between the humanities and natural sciences when it comes to methodology. Such an assumption is share, it shares with Ingold's concept discussed below, and it also coincides with the artist's postulates, which I discuss below. Uh, Susan Petrilli, in the perspective of science studies, points out the great potential of biosemiotics and its relation to global semiotics. The latter is a meta science concerned with all academic disciplines as sign related. It unites uh, this is the quote, it unites what other fields of knowledge and human practice generally keep apart, end of quotation. This is indeed crucial for the considerations proposed here. It emphasizes the necessary dialogue between various fields of knowledge and practice. Building bridges between disciplines obviously has consequences for the integration of their objects of interest. As Copley notes, biosemiotics assumes continuity in nature and resists considering culture as having a central position in the world. Quote, in the sphere of culture, there is a series of binaries that biosemiotics abolishes or modifies by treating life as continuous and by discerning semiosis across the realm of nature, namely agent subject, human, non-human, culture, living nature. End of quotation. Petrilli and Cobley, therefore, present the same position that could conclude it in a statement uh, proposing the continuity of semiosis in the world. Moreover, Cobley adds, the cultural sciences are based on the conviction that what, the natural world and the sciences devoted to studying it are geared to completely different reality, uh, realities from culture, then the study may be doomed to an eternal loop. Biosemiosis, biosemiotics premises a means to interrupt that loop, end of quotation. This brings me, I think, to a legitimate association with Thomas Sibiok's remark evoked by Cobley about the culture-nature relationship, namely that, here's the quote from Sibiok, that minuscule segments of nature, some anthropologists grandly counter 
compartment, I'm sorry, compartmentalized as culture, end of quotation, which only emphasizes the shift in perspective brought by global semiotics and biosemiotics. Uh, let us stop then at this change of perspective, which, which we can perhaps briefly call post-anthropocentric. It is characteristic both for biosemiotics and Ingold's anthropology, and also constitutes the foundation of the artistic realizations discussed below. The post-anthropocentric attitude, in a way related to post-humanism, is of course observed not only in the field of science, science but as I note, this very semiotic post-anthropocentrism is relatively unknown. In other words, while the post-anthropocentric orientation is contemporary in contemporary humanities, like post-humanism, environmental humanist, humanities, new ecologies, new materialism, blue humanities, and so on, is becoming more and more widespread, if not dominant, in sign theory, it is known almost only to semioticians and only to those who usually adapt such a perspective themselves. This is one of the main reasons I, uh, why I decided to dedicate this talk to a semiotic analysis of artistic practices in the light of biosemiotics. I am convinced that biosemiotics may turn out to be an excellent reference for activities carried out in the field of art. As far as the attempts to go beyond anthropocentric thinking are concerned, it is hard not to agree with the fact that over time semiotics has somehow lost its universal, universality which is reflected in the term general in favor of human or anthroposemiotics, like, for example, semiology in that sense. Biosemiotics and global semiotics seems to give, seem to give back to, to semiotics the capacity for general reflection, not only on human activity, here I mean culture or and civilization, depending on the vocabularies taken over, but on the whole universe of science, human and non-human. As Petrilli writes, quote, the object of global semiotics, of semiotics of life, is the semiosphere, end of quotation. And she immediately points out that, as we know, this term was introduced by Yuri Wolfman, but he limited it to human culture, while, another quote from Petrilli, from the perspective of global semiotics, where semiosis converges the life, the semiosphere identifies with the biosphere and emerges, therefore, as the semiobiosphere. End of quotation. At this point, however, it is worth noting that though Watman undeniably represented the semiotics of culture, he did not ignore nature. After all, in his text on the semiosphere, he characterized the semiosphere based on Vladimir Vernadsky's concept of biosphere, used biological nomenclature, like, for example, cell membrane, and expressed the need to expand the boundaries of the semiosphere to include elements of animate and inanimate nature. Thus, the semiosphere is not exclusively human, but global, built on interdependence. Such a statement is not quite in opposition to global semiotics. Of course, Watman does not speak here of the unity of life and semiotics, but neither does he limit the occurrence of the latter exclusively to culture. Petrilli, on the other hand, introduces the term semiobiosphere to highlight the complexity of the sign network. Culture, the human semiosphere, is understood here as the element of semiobiosphere larger than it, that is nature. To sum up, semiosphere is culture, whereas semiobiosphere is nature, that is nature together with culture located within it. In this section, I propose to take a look at the completely different perspective if we take into account theoretical and methodological issues, and at the same time, quite a parallel one if we look at the problematic postulates and conclusions. Namely, I have in mind the concept of Tim Ingold, an anthropologist who, as mentioned at the beginning, distances himself from semiotics. In the preface of a collection, to a collection of essays titled The Perception of the Environment, Essays on Livelihood, Dwelling and Skill, Ingold raises the question, quote, what it means for human beings, at once organisms and persons, to inhabit an environment, end of quotation. This quotation makes three important points. First, 
the recognition that human beings are simultaneously organisms and persons. Secondly, the verb to inhabit, again, marking precisely the act this activity and not more generally to live. And finally, thirdly, an environment, what will be one of the keywords of the anthropologist's conception. Ingold represents the view of the unity of the natural world and culture, which he shares with the assumptions of biosemiotics, although he clearly distances himself from the theory of science. Quote, the organism and the person could be one and the same. We should be trying to find a way of talking about human life that eliminates the need to slice it up into these different lawyers. End of quotation. Ingold postulates and adds that the reflection should be extended, quote, across the continuum of org organic life. End of quotation. Putting the matter in this way once again reveals the parallelism between the concept of anthropology and biosemiotic thought. As announced earlier, it is also worth pausing at Ingold's notion of the environment. It is not a passive background or scenery for human activity, but a realm that can affect people as much as people can affect it. Quote, my environment is the world as it exists and takes on meaning in relations to me. End of quotation. Ecology, in, the, in his understanding, is oriented towards what the life process itself. My aim is to replace the stale dichotomy of nature and culture with the dynamic synergy of organism and environment in order to regain a genuine ecology of life. End of quotation. It should be noted that the project Global Semiotics, discussed in the first part of the text, in dialogue with biosemiotics, is for Petrilli a starting point for a step further, which is her concept of semioetics, founded in collaboration with Augusto Poncio. The whole concept is based on the notion of responsibility. As John Dilly aptly puts in the preface, it is about quotation, human responsibility for the effects of anthroposemiosis upon the biosphere as a living whole, end of quotation, and the focus on the analysis of human activity, again a quote, upon the whole network of earthly life, apart from which the human species could not exist to act at all, end of quotation. The responsibility, of course, lies with humans, and it is a Another quote, responsibility for life on Earth, for human participation in biosemiosis as a whole, end of quotation. Such an appeal was also explicitly expressed by Ingol. It is precisely about dialogue, about coexistence, about reciprocity. This is also how Petrilli understands responsibility, human responsibility for life on Earth, maintaining dialogue, protecting nature and the environment, abounding an anthropocentric attitude in favor of a more equal one. Okay, let's now move to the uh, main uh, subject matter of my talk. Bearing in mind the above, one should not be surprised by the biosemiotic approach to the notion of the subject, which is based in short on extending it into the whole and an into the whole animated nature, I'm sorry. Quote, the human's agency is not unique in the natural world. The human, is, uh, the human is a natural subject. End of quotation from Cobley. Uh, and Cobley clearly indicates the entanglement of human beings with culture and thus presenting a non-anthropocentric stance. Moreover, the biosemiotic account of the subject is the result of the assumption of the continuity of semiosis in the world, the unity of culture and nature, or to be more precise, nature with the inclusion of culture. Quote, humans live in the realm of science, so too do other animals, end of quotation from Cobb. Thus, the non-anthropocentric perspective allows us to extend the concept of subjectivity to include non-humans in its scope. The basic determinants of subjectivity are, in the biosemiotic view, agency and the ability to make choices. As Kalevikul argues, choice is related to the future and thus to a certain set of possibilities to choose from. 
and the latter are available only to the living. Hence, life is linked to the ability to choose, which Kuhl captures in the statement, what existence of choice or existence of semiosis, end of quotation. Moreover, the act of choosing is at the same time an act of meaning making. It is thus a purely semiotic act. On the basis of the above remarks, let us now move our considerations to a slightly different plane. Namely, we will try to juxtapose the biosemiotic and Ingalls thinking about the subject and agency. The latter, though much less frequently than in the case of the concept arising from the biosemiotics, is also mentioned by Ingol. As he writes, quote, the entire world, and not just the world of human persons, is saturated with powers of agency and inten intentionality, end of quotation. He goes on to make this point very clearly and in a manner quite consistent with the biosemiotic perspective. Quotation, life in this view is not the realization of pre-specified forms, but the very process wherein forms are generated and held place. Everything, every being, as it is caught up in the process and carries it forward, arises as a singular center of awareness and agency." End of quotation. Ingold assumes, therefore, that life is a process that is in constantly in the process of creation and, consequently, he is convinced of the mutual creation of living environments by humans and non-humans. The essay, Building Dwelling Living, How Animals and People Make Themselves at Home in the World, beings um, with an inversion of the classical order of the primacy of form over process, and with the assumption of a casual subject in the environment, which in turn leads to the observation that the world gains its meaning through being inhabited. The opposition, but at the same time co-occurrence, of two perspectives, building and dwelling, thus becomes the main axis of the considerations proposed by the author. And for us, it becomes a point of reference for the analysis of the case study. Reconstructing Ingold's investigations as briefly as possible, we should say that the perspective of building, the one corresponding to the classical division of the world into the world of discourse and the physical world, considers building as the creation of affinite forms, the effect of a prior project. Dwelling, on the other hand, is based on flow, on process, and on phenomenological understanding of being in the world. This also allows him to distinguish human buildings from non-human ones. What? I show how we might distinguish between human and non-human constructions in the terms of the building perspective, on the basis of the presence or absence of an intentional project of design. End of quotation. This raises the question of intentionality and anticipation. Are humans, uh, I'm sorry, are non-humans capable of planning and designing? Is there then such a thing as non-human design? If so, is it based on planning or is it the result of action and making choices here and now? Choices that will concern the future, as Kalevi Kul writes, after all, take place here and now, in the moment of now, as he writes. So you can also influence the future without planning. Concluding, Ingold, however, state that, quote, it is in the very process of dwelling that we build. End of quotation. It is therefore impossible to distinguish between the two processes, building and dwelling, just as it's impossible to distinguish between culture and nature. Here we can also see, firstly, why I mentioned above the dwelling, that dwelling would be for Ingold an even more important verb than living, and also, secondly, hidden in this statement is indirectly to the, ans the answer to our above question about the possibility of design by non-human animals. The answer, therefore, let us be clear, would be that the very act of dwelling is actually the act of building. It is a process. It does not have an initial form, a project that is unchangeable regardless of how its realization turns out, nor a final form, 
because while living in a seemingly, re seemingly ready-made structure, we change it, whether we are human or non-human subjects. It is made possible by our, both human and non-human animals, agency and the possibility of making choices, which, as cool climbs, we make in the moment of now and which design our future. Um, relationships existing between science and art are discussed by Kalevi Kul and Yekaterina Velmezova, who write that, quote, scientific models can be presented by various means, schemes, drawings, environmental design, etc. Moreover, in general, formal models can hardly be used without any non-formal con contextualized presentations, end of quotation. The authors, referring among others to the notion of the semiotic freedom, state that, quote, new forms are constantly breaking barriers, opening up unexpected horizons, end of quotation, what is characteristic for art, but for nature as well. This is, among others, what life and art share. And let's uh, treat this uh, short remark made by Kul and Velmezova as a kind of a bridge to the uh, second half of my talk, uh, which is uh, based on the um, kind of attempt to analyze or to, to read uh, some artistic projects, artistic realizations with the usage of biosemiotics uh, perspective and as well with the usage of Ingold's uh, anthropology. So um, here is the, the first, uh, first of two uh, artistic projects I want to refer to. Uh, both of these projects, uh, let, me, let me note at the very beginning of the second half, of my talk uh, are uh, realized by Polish artists and of course if we if we even can talk about the kind of I don't know nationality in art uh, uh, I guess that uh, it is worth stressing because uh, it is al always very nice to introduce some local uh, local concept artistic concepts uh, to the audience uh, to the international audience so um, this is one of of reasons uh, why I decided to uh, present you uh, particularly these, uh, these realizations. Uh, so let's start with the first one. Zoopolis, a non-anthropocentric design for all living subjects inhabiting their Umwelt. Zoopolis project entitled Building the Human-Non-Human -Human Community includes two exhibitions and a book publication, which I will present shortly below. There were two Zoopolis exhibitions. The first one, Zoopolis Design for Plants and Animals from 2017, whose aim was to create a real, real, a real utopia, urban space, buildings, objects designed for a better humans and non-humans life, and which is based on the concept of Zoe, a vital life without any boundaries. The second exhibition, entitled Zoopolis Design for Weeds and Pets, Pests, from 2019 was held in a vital exhibition space. Its authors were humans, which can be called artists, and non-humans, like water, pigeon, fungus, as well. In order to demonstrate the idea of vital matter, where no boundaries or differences between individuals and its surroundings are to be found. Okay. Uh, yes. So here is the book, Zoopolis Building the Human Non Human Community from 2020. It is a collection of texts and interviews on the subject communicated in the title, in the title and it is also a catalogue of works. Mm -hmm. For instance, among the authors of the works listed on the cover there are Monika Rosińska, who is an artist, Susan uh, Jelawich, and so on. So these are humans, or as we could say in the reference to above discussion, human subjects. But we will also find here, for example, linden, fruit fly, water and earth. 
It is perhaps hard to find a better depiction of community, non-anthropocentric perspective, and the continuity of the semiosis of life. Uh, of course, you can see here uh, the book is um, written in Polish, so uh, this, uh, in this uh, picture you can see the Polish names of uh, some different species of plants and animals, as well as some other subjects like water, earth, already mentioned by me. Uh, and you can see among them also names of, of artists, of scientists who, who wrote some particular essays. So it is a kind of a mixture and they are put in alphabetical order, as you can see. The last one is Ziemia, which means earth. Um, Co-authorship of works between both humans and non-humans, blurring of the boundaries between the object and the process under which the matter is submitted to changes, is reflected in the way the works of art are presented in the book. The reader can find an index of creators and co-creators in which every individual is marked with a number. Separate works in alphabetical order are signed by letters. At the crossings of these two markings, the information of the species and persons co-creating a given piece of art is to be found. The Zoopolis project, as we can read in the preface uh, with the much telling title Suburbia, is based on the concept of the design for plants and animals since such a design has been so far limited to consumerism and wildlife conservation. The main premise of the project is therefore the acknowledgement that, here is the quotation, the design for humans and non-humans has to, first of all, create human-non-human -human community, end of quotation. Not surprisingly, the authors refer here to the concept introduced by Donna Haraway and Bruno Latour, based on posthumanism and post-anthropocentrism. Moreover, here is another quote, the object, spaces and architecture would play the role of mediators working in the egalitarian community based on the relations connecting people, other animals, plants, fungi and microorganisms. End of quotation. The editors write, and thereby, though using a different conceptual apparatus than, for example, biosemiotics, they fit into the main theoretical postulates formulated within the concepts presented above. Zoopolis, moreover, is against dualism, such as human, other animals, nature, culture, wildness, civilization, beneficial species, pests, and questions of individualism as well. As such, it represents a perfect realization of the theoretical and ethical postulates discussed below, above. It is worth uh, revisiting Cobley's cultural implications of biosemiotics and evoking his important words in this context. Here is the quotation. Anti-humanist thinkers in biosemiotics, such as Peirce, Sibiok, Petrilli and Dilly, do not put the individualized human at the center of existence, nor do they trade in uh, essences such as self-interest or apply universal categories to people. The anti-humanism in biosemiotics, in particular, uh, envisages humans within semiosis and within umwelten. And another quote, the human is, like all, organism, like all organisms, a reposi repository of certain adjective functions within a set of determinations generally called nature. The anti-humanism in biosemiotics um, envisages humans within semiosis and within umwelten. Um, oh, I'm sorry, here is the, uh, the same part of the, the same sentence uh, uh, comes two times, I'm sorry. Um, kind of a mistake. Uh, since we are talking about a project called Zoopolis, it should be explained where the idea came from. We should start with a biosemiotic explanation. It is, of course, a combination of words zoe and polis. When it comes to the second affix, that is polis, Cobley understandably refers it to a typically human activity. 
As for the first part of the proje project's name, that is ZOE, Kobli draws attention to the distinction otherwise derived from other scientific discourse between ZOE, life as such, and BIOS, the, or BIOS, the life of an individual or group having its beginning and end. The authors of the exhibition understand both Polis and ZOE in this way. As you can read on the first page of the exhibition, The title refers to the concept of zoopolis by Sue Donaldson and Will Kimnitska, which includes granting animals citizenship. However, in the title of the exhibition, the word zoo has been replaced by zoe, which means bare life, vitality, in other words, something that is common to all living creatures. Thus, the exhibition will try to look at design from a radical non-anthropocentric perspective. And it is this non-anthropocentric perspective that I believe is the clue. Well, as, in, as is the case with biosemiotics and Ingo's anthropology, it is all about the change of perspective, about recognizing the subjectivity and agency of non-human individuals, about their ability to shape their environments through the choices they make, and about concern with for the ethical dimension, in short, for well-being of all beings. Generally speaking, both exhibitions are founded on the same basis, that is, an experiment, a design's mediation which interspecies, within interspecies relations, non-anthropocentric, or it can be also called universal design, involvement, bindings and knots, and non-human agency. All these elements are also fundamental to the theories discussed above. Non-anthropocentric design is nothing more than a design that is turned towards co-being, not just human well-being, and conducted from a human perspective. After all, after all, what are, na what are nature reserves, nesting boxes for birds, clothes for pets or gardens, they all have in common the human perspective that lies at the very beginning of the future-oriented design process. It is man who decides which species to protect, which to exterminate, which to uh, nurture and put on display, which to remove, which are useful to humans, of course, which are harmful. The division into weeds and pets, pests, and the title of the second exhibition exposes precisely the human perspective. Zoopolis is an attempt, an experiment to create, here is a quote, a mixed human-non-human -human community, which is realized through the mediation of design in interspecies relations, end of quotation. Nevertheless, we should add that non-anthropocentric design is a part of a broader concept that is universal design. Mm -hmm. Let us look at the two exhibitions separately. Zoopolis, designed for plants and animals, the first one from 2017, uh, reflected, uh, here is the quote, reflected on our relationships with associated species such as dogs, potted plants and the microbiome, end of quotation, and was based on the idea of, uh, another quote, to create a real utopia. Um, basing on the concept of ZOE, end of quotation. It was thus organized in a typically human space, that is, the gallery space, established for such pur uh, purposes, and addressed the issue of human relationships with other species already domesticated by humans. As we can read in the description of the uh, exhibition on the website, Human-centered design is one of the most popular slogans among designers and companies in recent years. But if we look closer, it turns out that the design has always been focused on mankind. And at least in Western culture, Homo sapiens used to be considered as a measure of all the things. What would happen if we challenged this concept? Can we even think of design whose subjects would not would be non-humans, plants and animals? 
How could such an approach rebuild the existing relationships between human and non-human animals, as well as other living organisms? The creators of the exhibition followed this thought. Design is treated here as a vehicle for ideas, as a link, a mediator between the human world, that is semiosphere, and the non-human world, biosphere, creating the foundations for the semi-biosphere. Non-human oriented design does not mean designing bird houses or gadgets for dogs, but is oriented toward interspecies relations, coexistence, biosemiotic dialogue. A quote, zoe based design should not be limited to an essential subject. It, is ra it rather needs to be founded on the transversal and related form of subjectivity. End of quote. It should be noted how close they are to Cobley's statement, who writes that, quote, the humanities tasks, task is to present ways to understand the limits of human agency and its continuity with the agency of other organisms of the planet, end of quotation. The perspective of cohabitation of various subjects, as well as the desire to meet their needs, and take care of their rights, which, after all, Petrilli emphasizes so much in her semioethics project, is also very important to the creators of this exhibition. Quote, the curators of the exhibition, Monika Rosińska and Agata Szydłowska, will look for solutions that treat animals and plants as full-fledged project processors, taking into account their needs and rights. At the same time, they do not forget about men who, uh, um, precipitated from the pedestal of privileged species, enters into a complex, cohabitable and competitive relationships with other animals and living organisms. Um, and here you can see in this slide uh, just uh, one example uh, of the pieces of art presented in, uh, in this exhibition. Uh, this is the, the work uh, entitled The Leash. And uh, as you can see, uh, here is the, the short description of, of the idea of this work, uh, which says that uh, a leash is a metaphor of relationships, uh, of relations designed to eliminate the aspects of violence. Dog and human are one entity here. So it is not just a passive dog and active human who, uh, who uh, holds the, uh, the end of the leash and the dog needs to, uh, to be passive and do what the human uh, wants uh, him to do, him or her or it. Um, but uh, they are uh, related to each other and they are both uh, active subjects. The second exhibition, uh, Zoe Poli's Design for Weeds and Pets from 2019, could be said to represent an important step forward. The venue for this realization was the space of Nośna Foundation in Kraków Zabłocie. Thus, it was a fluid and vital space. The authors were inhabitants, like humans, artists, and non-humans. Moreover, not only the relations between human and non-human subjects, but also, natural but also natural subjects environment, became the focus of activities. Additionally, the relations with the vistula, visible outside the window, window or with the mat surrounding the building, were not ignored. Thus, the relations between, a quote, organisms, water, soil, as well as urban planners, developers, and other actors in the urban ecosystems, ecosystem, end of quotation, were highlighted. Um, and the building itself, that is, the site of the exhibition, was full of various forms of life. As Ingold would say, it is inhabited by pigeons, humans, and fruit flies. Consider the example of the oak tree and Uxkul's house modified by the anthropologist, and we will see how interesting it would be to read the building in which the exhibition took place as many umwelten, human and non-human. Everything here was based on coexistence and intersubjective cooperation. Uh, at, and at the same time on the 
here is the quote, the recognition of the agency of non-humans in the context of the structures created by these non-humans, end of quotation. The mutual recognition of subjectivity is emphasized repeatedly by both biosemioticians and Ingold. Moreover, we can conclude that non-human subjects design is indeed the design here and now, in the moment of now, as school writes. It is not planning for the future, but designing by dwelling. We build as long as we dwell. In this context, it is worth mentioning one work presented in the exhibition under the title Roommates. And this particular piece of art you can uh, now see in the slide. The houses built by men are inhibited, as we know, not only by men. The inhabitants are various non-human subjects, some more, some less visible. Some live their lives undisturbed by the presence of humans. Others are disturbed by humans and even end their lives because of humans. Of course, the opposite can also happen. It, it is the non-human inhabitants who can make life difficult for humans. However, what is the essence of the work roommates is the idea of creating engraved brass plaques, the same that the human subjects attach to door of their house or apartment with the name of the non-human resident. They were placed whether, uh, wherever the roommate res, uh, resides, on the ceiling, floor, uh, in the nooks, or uh, on the balcony, let's say, for example, near to the window. In this way, no inhabitant is anonymous and their subjectivity is acknowledged and announced to other inhabitants. Uh, quote, environment is never complete is continually under construction. Environment shapes us and we shape it. It's not the same as nature for a being that does not belong to it. End of quotation. This, is, this was the quotation from Ingold, who writes uh, and presents thereby the essence of biosemiotic thinking. Quote, many organisms do not simply exist in an otherwise unchanging neutral environment. Rather, their activity to some degree shapes and changes their Umwelt, their Umwelt so that its affordances more easily allow for the organism to enact its activities." End of quotation. Active causal inhabitation uh, is an expression of involvement to which Petrilli has devoted much attention. It seems that the creators, human and non-human, of both discussed exhibitions are perfectly aware of that and, by means of art and design, are heading for an ethically better coexistence. Uh, and now let's move to the second um, artistic project I would like to pay some attention to. Uh, this is the Center for Living Things uh, from 2019 by Diana Lelonek. Um, and as it can be read in the introduction uh, to the Waste Plants Atlas, Lelonek has conducted research, what clearly indicates the art and science entanglement mentioned by Kohl and Velmezova. Lelonek is an artist, visual, a visual artist, who works mainly in photography, but she uh, co-works uh, very uh, closely with scientists, especially with uh, some biologists. So uh, this expression that the artist Lelonek has conducted research uh, is very, um, very uh, signifying. The Center for Living Things um, was under auspices that the herbarium came to be, housed within the botanical garden of the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. And uh, what is uh, interesting, what, what needs to be mentioned at the very beginning of this, this last part of my talk, uh, which is the, the, this part, uh, is that uh, the Center for Living Things was a kind of uh, installation which took place in the Botanical Garden. And then uh, we've got this Waste Plants Atlas I will show you uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, where we can find some uh, pictures and photographs uh, made on the took on the basis of this installation entitled the Center for Living Things. 
So uh, in her project, Lelonek has combined three different spheres. Theoretical one, uh, the project addresses the philosophical and aesthetic consequences of the Anthropocene. Uh, Lelonek um, uh, quite often refers to Bruno Latour, for example. Uh, secondly, uh, this project offers a starting point for a collaboration with the natural sciences while respecting the discipline's internal principles. So, in other words, Lelonek is not going, uh, was not going to change natural sciences to force biologists to start thinking in an artistic way, but she respected uh, the, the norms uh, and um, some uh, principles of uh, botanists, for example, uh, and uh, she, um, what she does uh, is taking pictures of, uh, which are of course artistic, of some um, examples find in, in nature, let's say, but can we uh, talk about nature or culture, this of course problematic. And uh, thirdly, uh, Lelonek combines uh, the artistic endeavor. It exists as a complex work of art in the form of an installation accompanied, uh, accompanied by parallel activities. So interdisciplinarity was, uh, of course, of the highest importance here in this project. Uh, here is the quotation from, uh, from the introduction. Uh, as Wasilewski writes, uh, Lelonek uh, tried to describe complex human and non-human nets of interdependency. This is very uh, kind of a keyword here, the nets, like we re keeping in mind the Bruno Latour's concept or Ingolf based on some kind of network. So here we've got the, the net of interdependency to recognize assemblages of mutual contingency and to finally move beyond our fixation on human action toward a deeper examination of interspecies relations. End of quotation. It can be referred to Petrulli's concept of building bridges between disciplines and, on the other hand, biosemiotic dialogue and being involved in a complex net of relations. The Center for Living Things pursues the in-depth study of ongoing and highly visible transformations in the biosphere, writes Wasilewski. And uh, here in the slide, you can see the, um, the effect, the result of the Center for Living Things uh, as an installation. So you can see the waste plant atlas, which is a new kind of herbarium. New kind of herbarium where uh, there are, um, it is not a collection of dried plants, but a report on the effects of human activity on certain species of plants. It can be referred to Petrilli's notion of responsibility and involvement. Uh, so what can we find here are uh, dehumanized hybrid forms uh, which gain precedence over the flora we have thus far deemed natural. Uh, Lelonek deals with the humankind's supremacy over nature. Can we even still talk about nature? Is nature something absolutely separate? These are the question, uh, questions uh, Lelonek poses, and uh, she also uh, mentions um, the, the main problem for her, which is the, um, which are the limitations of our language, that uh, we are still talking about uh, the culture, nature, entanglement. We still uh, try to look at uh, other species as subjects uh, and agents as humans are. But still, we don't have um, a flexible and appropriate language to, to call these relations. We are still, to some extent, violent in our human talking about nature. So this is also a kind of a, kind of a problem uh, Lelonek deals with, and she, she still does. So uh, there's, uh, we still do not have the answer or solution of this problem. Uh, yes, and um, uh, uh, let's just uh, have a look at these uh, hybrid forms of waste plants um, as a kind of a new, 
as a new kind of an artistic work. Uh, as Andrzej Marzec puts it, waste plants are ephemeral and ever-changing. They are the products of multiple authors and reflect the collaborative efforts uh, of a collective that remains more or less anonymous. They speak to the power of non-human creativity. End of quotation. This kind of creativity, uh, Marzec uh, says, fully dissolves the human vision of art. Creativity and art in the anthropocentric and biosemiotics views are totally different. While in the first one they are considered a specifically human domain, in the latter they can be related to the so-called semiotic freedom I mentioned in reference to Kul and Belmezova. Uh, and here you can uh, find a quite long uh, quote from Paul Cobley. Uh, I think there is no need to uh, read it out loud. So if you want, you can just have a, a quick look at it. It is about uh, the semiotic freedom as uh, Jesper Hofmeier uh, conceptualizes it. So um, this is just to, to clarify uh, this concept, but there is no need to talk about it in, in details. Uh, so this is just a purely biosemiotic approach to, to semiotic freedom which I propose uh, after Kalevi to, uh, to to transmit into the, the domain of art. So let's see. Um, okay, yeah. Semiotic freedom is strictly connected with the activity of interpretants, but with the notion of choice as well. As Cobley writes, the matter, um, the matter has to be considered in biosemiotics because, apart from anything else, it is a part of agentive action. Semiotic freedom necessarily involves choice of one curse rather than another. In studying such freedom, there is often a need to investigate the choices that get rejected and why, particularly as they may later become choices once more or they may be opportunities for the organism to revisit or relive the moment of choice. In larger context, we can say that semiotic freedom can be juxtaposed with um, unhindered explosive creativity, which is unpredictable, just as artistic creativity. This is why we can still talk about non-human artistic creativity. When moving back to Lelomek's Waits Plants Atlas, one should pay attention to the notion of agency in the light of semiotic freedom. The post-human trashes become an object of non-human creativity. Here is another quote from Andrzej Marzec. Human uh, detritus de consists of uh, emancipated objects that, let, uh, that lead fleeting, generative, unfettered and above all non-human lives." End of quotation. Uh, the matter is active and as such it has powers to create new forms basing on objects that in human view are useless, like trash. Waste plants, uh, this is a quote, uh, may be the clearest instance of matter's generative activity and the underestimated creative agency of non-human actors." End of quotation. Uh, and uh, here you can see, as well as uh, in the upcoming slides, uh, some uh, pictures uh, collected in this uh, herbarium uh, entitled Waste Plants uh, Atlas. Uh, you can see uh, some uh, species of particular plants uh, which uh, inhabit um, post-human um, objects uh, and thus doing so they create a kind of a new uh, pieces of art if we can use this term again here is the problem with the nomenclature and the problem of the limitations of language of human language uh, what is interesting uh, in this uh, herbarium um, Lelonek proposes, uh, Lelonek uses uh, the very botanical way, scientific botanical way of um, describing particular species, particular findings 
let's say. So um, she distinguishes a few types of uh, environments. Here you can see the example of a post footwear environment. This is how she calls it. Um, and uh, uh, firstly, we can see here the name of the of the particular plant, which is a blackberry. Then we've got in Latin uh, uh, its name. Then the material uh, this plant lives. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then we've got the geographical position of the finding uh, with the uh, latitude and the longitude. Uh, please excuse me, I didn't uh, rewrite to the slides all these um, degrees of, of this uh, geographical position. It, it would be too hard to do, but uh, please believe me that there are very particular uh, degrees or points of uh, geographic position. So she, ju she just uh, does this description as uh, botanicians do. And at the same time, she still is an artist. So this is a very interesting combination, I guess. Um, okay. Um, I, I got lost, but yeah, I'm yeah, uh, I'm back. Uh, quote: Waste plants are a collective, a coalition of alias and uh, intimate non-humans. Their bonds generate responsibility, response ability. This is uh, also very nice uh, to, to express this this combination: response ability. Uh, end of quotation. It can be read in the light of Petrilli's responsibility considered in the ethical context and biosemiotic dialogue between humans and non-humans. It is also the kind of human responsibility of the whole semiobiosphere, the system of a living whole humans and non-humans live in. What is extremely interesting and what binds the plots of biosemiotic approach to Zoe and Zoepolis project is that, according to Majet, Waste plants, here is the quote, do not qualify as an instance of their uh, life, like Zoe, for they cannot exist if not through constant creative activity. In fact, by merely living, they are works of art. So we can see that the life and art are uh, inseparab inseparably uh, connected. Lelonek's ephemeral and spontaneous objects exist in a constant state of transformation. This is another quote. They are remarkably flexible. Every day they are different. Their form is not fixed, for they exist in process. A production more so reproduction. End of quotation. We can clearly see here a striking analogy to Ingold's concept of building and dwelling, which, as we note above, can be expressed as what? It is in the very process of dwelling that we build, end of quotation. It happens in the moment of now and has its result, results in the future. And uh, of course, uh, here you can see another example, uh, again from, uh, the type, from this type of uh, environment, which is post footwear environment. Uh, and uh, here you can see the, the English name uh, with the, uh, the Latin one of this particular species of plant. And then uh, you can see the description of the material the shoe is made from and uh, some other information about uh, the place where it was found, uh, just as we can find in botanical books. Um, waste plants and humans share a lack of certainty. The countless contingencies known as life, Majet writes. And this is the unpredictability, semiotic freedom, agency and design in the moment of now that allow us to talk about the natural subjects, both human and non-human, living in one semiobiosphere and being creative. 
Um, and uh, once again, here you can see another examples uh, now from a different uh, different type, uh, not a foodware uh, post foodware environment, but from a polymer habitats, uh, some uh, some plastic packaging um, and uh, and the pet bottle. So uh, yeah, this is the, the another example. Uh, and some more uh, now from post electronic habitats and pseudo stone substrate. So uh, what combines what is uh, common for uh, all these examples, uh, all these objects is that um, uh, we got some plants that uh, abandon the realm of nature, let's say, which is natural for them, and try to and occupy, try to live in some post-human uh, environments. So the objects left by humans. So they are the, the living example of combining and entangling culture with, with nature. Um, and what is more, they doing so, that is living, they create an, um, a new object, which in our human perspective, we can consider as art. Uh, yes. And, um, mm, and yes, you can see here um, some other examples. Uh, again, from post foodware environments and post stone substrate. And uh, uh, here is the quote I already read. Um, what is interesting is that uh, we can say that waste plants uh, are creative uh, since they are creating new forms. But when we want to use the human perspective, it can be quite controversial to say that the plants are creative in the, in the artistic sense. But uh, what Lelonek proposes in her work is that uh, to, um, to consider, to understand uh, creation as a kind of um, agency, as a kind of uh, vitalism, as a kind of freedom and, and the freedom of expression rather than uh, limiting it to a very uh, narrow uh, terms of, of art or aesthetics. And finally, uh, finally conclusions. Uh, the main axis in this talk um, are the processes of dwelling and creating very strongly united with life. Life, in turn, in the light of the concepts presented here, is a process in which natural subjects are entangled, capable of causa, uh, causative actions, and equipped with the ability to make choices. These choices shape their living environments just as those environments shape them. Along this coexistence and cohabitation, human and non-human design occurs, hence the talk of non-anthropocentric design, which I proposed to place within the framework of non-anthropocentric thinking in biosemiotics and anthropology. Zoopolis and Waste Plants Atlas remain a human artistic creation, of course, but one that speaks volumes. The humanities, here is the quote, tasks is to present ways to understand the limits of human agency and its continuity with the agency of other organisms on the planet, end of quotation. It is important to follow this thought and care for semiobiosphere, the world we inhabit and creatively design together, because biosemiotic dialogue of human and non-human subjects is found on these very activities. And thank you very much for your attention and patience at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. I was uh, really, really interested uh, uh, about a lot of uh, uh, issues you, you addressed, uh, especially, I would say, the problem of uh, 
planning of non-human beings uh, uh, and about uh, intentionality. It was uh, at the beginning, you spoke about it uh, at the beginning of your uh, speech, of your talk, and at the end when you said uh, we have to think about uh, non-human creativity as vitalism and not as intention, mm -hmm. plan, uh, not as... Because in art, uh, we have to say that uh, the artist, the human artist, uh, has always a legacy to the past. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's always a quotation of other, um, of other yeah. works, uh, a, a differentiation from other works, and so on, and nature. Uh, obviously has not the legacy to the past mm -hmm. so this is a big difference uh, not only intentionality of the artist and so on but the problem of uh, of the legacy to to a tradition uh, because even the the most revolutionary artist uh, uh, has of to course. deal uh, with, yeah. uh, with the past um i would like to ask you something mm. I really like the examples, uh, the, the post footwear environment. I, I, I really appreciate. Um, I have to say that when uh, we read the Ingold and the other uh, Cobley and other scholars, uh, um, we have the idea that. Uh, they are philosophers, uh, in the sense that, yes, anthropologists, okay, but uh, mm, that they are not semioticians, <laughs> in the yeah. sense that uh, semiotics has really to, 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 to address the problem of description, mm -hmm. uh, description of, the, of a discourse, uh, an object is a discourse, as uh, Michela Deni uh, explain to us uh, after uh, after uh, Flosch and other uh, scholars. So, um, uh, do you think that Ingold, uh, Cobley, and Susan Petrilli, uh, scholars that I really I really admire, but I think that they don't propose tools uh, for description. Uh, for the description, for instance, of, uh, of artworks. Uh, in this sense, Latour is a little bit different because Latour, with the legacy to Grimacian, uh, Grimacian um, mm -hmm. uh, description tradition, uh, when he speaks about actantiality, uh, he's really saying that uh, uh, two subjectivities uh, are collaborating in the sense that he can describe, uh, even in the description of a scientific work, uh, mm -hmm. a, a text does uh, what does uh, what the cell does in a pr process that can be described, really precisely described. Mm -hmm. So he uses, for instance, enunciation, uh, actantiality, uh, all uh, about what we spoke during the, the lunch, mm -hmm. the, 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 the closeness of Latour to, to Grimacian uh, methodology. Uh, so I think that it would be it's a proposition, it's a proposal that I um, that I made to you. Uh, I think that uh, enunciation, for instance, would be interesting to 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 uh, to use. Uh, to, it would be interesting to use enunciation. Uh, enunciation in in which sense? The sense that, for instance, Fontani and others uh, have. Uh, uh, worked a lot on the thickness of the discourse, uh -huh. uh, thickness in the sense that it's a co-enunciation, but it's not only a problem of co-enunciation, like in the tradition, uh, I don't know, Bakhtin and so on, the, the poly-enunciation, it's not only this, it's the problem of the modes of existence, in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, for instance, in these, in these uh, kind of examples, um, sorry, I am a little bit uh, slow because uh, in English I'm, um, 
I take more time to express myself. I, I, I say sorry to the participants, remotely remote participants, because I hope that they will have uh, questions for, for for Kathleen. For you, but um, it's uh, that uh, I I want to say that the, the trickiness of of this course can be that can be studied through the problem of virtuality, potentiality, um, actualization, and realization. In the sense that, for instance, if we look at the post future uh, environment, we want to say yes, the human did. The, uh, a virtual action in the sense abandon uh, a shoe. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest, uh, the actualization has done um, uh, by a non human being. And then at the end, uh, the human realizes mm -hmm. <laughs> the realization of an uh, work of art uh, through um, changing the environment of the object. So, for instance, so I think that we could go uh, through these tools, uh, mm -hmm. uh, modalities probably as well, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. We could go, go beyond the problem of the philosophy of, uh, of, mm -hmm. um, of non-humanistic, uh, non uh, because it's what uh, I think it's what uh, semiotics uh, asks uh, <laughs> to us. Yeah. Uh, we, so, uh, I'll give you the floor uh, uh, to, to, to Michela, but I will listen to the, to the answer. Uh, yeah. So I would say that, uh, as you said already, that uh, Ingold, for example, uh, is not a semiotician, so he is not uh, so worried about the discourse, about mm. the way we are uh, describing the discourse. But, uh, Cobley and the object as a discourse, not only the, as uh, uh, yeah. uh, as this, this describer, <laughs> but uh, the fact that every object is a discourse. Uh, yeah, uh, but when it comes to uh, Pagini and Cobley, they are semioticians, but more oriented towards biosemiotics. Uh, so the perspective they uh, decided to 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 took for their research uh, is um, very far from this kind of semiotics you are talking about. Since the Grammarian semiotics, yes, yes. yeah, this is uh, more connected to structuralism, semiology and so on and so on. So I, I do not know if we can combine these two perspectives. Maybe it will be um, a step further, as you said, uh, but uh, Latour is already a combination uh, in the sense that yeah. they, we can have a big philosophy in Latour mm -hmm. theory, we can say, but at the same time, uh, with uh, his uh, ethnographical past uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and his interest for this course, there we can find a point. A uh, crossing point, a yeah, crossing point. in Latour, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's only a problem of description. I understand that some biosemioticians uh, are not interested in description. Uh, in, the meantime, in the meantime, I think that we are poor philosophers when we are, we are only philosophers. <laughs> So this is why I insist on, on the problem of description. Uh, yeah, so this is a very new perspective for me to think about this problem. So mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. I guess that I should have some time to think about yes, it. Yes, so yes, sure. I don't have a ready answer for you, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. I made notes. So <laughs> I will think about it. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kathleen. Um, Michela, uh, Vazi. Thank you very much for the very interesting conference. And uh, we also had a conference, a big conference in Nîmes uh, in uh, July. Uh, and I will, uh, I will, I will write you the the document of the conference in the chat. And it's a pity that uh, we 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 don't collaborate. Uh, and also with our uh, our lab uh, in University of Nîmes Project Lab. Innovation by design, and uh, so I will uh, I will write you the, the the address of the lab, and uh, I agree with Maria Giulia about Latour and his analysis and 
and description that uh, we need uh, in semiotics, but uh, I appreciate also uh, another uh, point of view as uh, as your and very interesting work. And I would uh, I would really like to to keep in touch uh, for your work and our work. Thank you. So I am looking for for the the information you you will send me. Thank you so much. Michela did uh, important. Uh, books uh, in Italian, written in Italian, I think, uh, about affectivity of objects um, at the beginning of her career. And then, uh, yes, she, she, she was more interested in design as such, not, not only on, on isolated objects. You can correct me. Uh, uh, Michela, uh, now she she really looks at the design as um, as something how to say uh, uh, vital, uh, something that uh, that really inhabits our our way of thinking as well. Yes, it's also because uh, I'm uh, the director of a project lab project, and uh, we do uh, social design. About uh, human being uh, design also, so it's uh, it's for this reason that I'm really interested in your work. Uh, uh, Michela, if you have uh, some uh, text in English, uh, you can send it to to Kathleen. Oh, it would be wonderful. Um, the chat, it's it. Uh, I wrote it in the chat. Now it's not my text for uh, for now, but uh, I will uh, I will give you. But it's about the colloque uh, in Nim and uh, the project lab. Mediation. Oui, oui. Je sais les retrouver de toute façon moi ce site. Hein? Oui, oui. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michela. Um, someone else uh, would like to ask for a question to Kathleen. Yeah, a similar question so. about uh, the methodology, but uh, not only the methodology. If we adopt this perspective in which uh, um, there is not only the action of humans, uh, then uh, how, we can, how can we find some object of study, object of research? Uh, so this idea that we have to look to process and not object, not science. So how we can find some object of, of research? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that these are the objects of research, but they are uh, still in the process. So they are changing. For example, just uh, Talking very literally, not metaphorically, uh, Diana Lelonek has a great problem uh, how to um, collect these objects, uh, how to make them being alive still, because she cannot put them in the museum like, I don't know, some, we've got some museums of, nat of nature with, with this, um, oh, how to say it in English, stuffed animals, uh, you know what I mean, stuffed animals and I don't know, some pieces of rocks and something like that in, in particular uh, uh, places in the museum, uh, since these are uh, still living objects and they are transforming, they are, uh, they are different every day. So uh, I guess that um, your question was how to um, how can we treat them as already made objects, or, or, or even uh, from a, an epistemological point of view? Okay. How to find the, the object? It's not the, the correct word, but uh, we are interested in, in what? Uh, how we can build the object of uh, knowledge uh, by adopting this point of view? Uh, which uh, it's, it's uh, border that than the idea of studying science uh, languages. So it's really a, an epistemological, epistemological uh, question. Mm -hmm. Where we do we do uh, find our our um, object of knowledge, even if uh, there, there there is no object or there is uh, only processes only processes. But so 
what what are you what what are we searching for? I would say that the the very object of research is the temporality, maybe in the mm -hmm. in this uh, in this yes. topic since. I was still referring to the future, but uh, Maria uh, changed my perspective, asking about the past and the tradition. And, uh, yes. So, so uh, then I realized that, yeah, we are talking about temporality, I would say. And this is what uh, you, Maria, in your uh, last book, write about the temporality of an image. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. so the, this but, dimension of temporality, I would say, yes. is the problem. Yes. Since we are talking yes. about the process, yes. about transformation, about yes. changing environment, so maybe the object of research indeed is Yes, it's, it's time because we are waiting for the transformations mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, so now the photos uh, have uh, this as uh, as object, and in six months uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we can fix something else. Uh, uh, and it's possible that one object put in a re close to another. He can, uh, yeah. He can and uh, create a new one. Uh, yes, because uh, they can communicate in a sense, in the sense that yeah. the, the the lines of the natural uh, plants can be combined. For instance, for instance. Uh, so yes, temporality is a, is a central. It's a problem that uh, we we do not have really had before. Mm -hmm. Temporality and subjectivity, I would say, to, to some extent, considered as a ability to making choices, to create some new forms, to express new new forms, yeah. Yes, okay. but... Mm -hmm. It's really the idea of, of objectify temporality. Mm -hmm. Try, try, uh, find yes. a way to objectify yes, in, yes. A, in a scientific yes. manner yes. temporality. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, subjectivity for me is more difficult to, to understand in the sense, uh, uh, yes, create a new form, but w which is the subject, uh, in the sense, uh, who takes the initiative. Yeah. This is why I spoke to you about the modes of existence, mm -hmm. because in the mode of existence, uh, there are modes of existence and not. Uh, the problem of the subject, the subjectivity yeah. that is even mm -hmm. in the in the in the works on uh, enunciation today, uh, there is a discussion because there is a debate. Uh, uh, the first person is uh, is uh, is always uh, is always the first, the second person. The dialogue mm -hmm. is always interesting for us, or as Deleuze said, as Latour said, as uh, mm -hmm. Paolucci mm -hmm. said. The impersonal point of view is more interesting. The multiple point of view is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. So subjectivity is always something hard to to address if we do not precise that it can uh, be a multiple. Yeah. Uh, and there is another problem with subject. I would say that this this term, this notion of subject, is very. Uh, strongly grounded in the Western philosophy. And it is sometimes hard to yes. abandon this perspective yes. and to think about, let's say, some plants, that they are subjects. So this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. quite controversial for us, right. trained in Western philosophy. So no. yes. yes. Thank you so much to Kathleen, to Enzo. Someone else in remote? Uh, Remotely, would like to ask a question to Kathleen. If not, I really thank uh, Kathleen uh, for uh, her wonderful uh, talk, all the assistants, Michela, Marika, Laura, Maria Viola, and Khan. Uh, and uh, other people who were connected. And uh, I tell you goodbye. You, you know that here in Liège tomorrow we have another uh, talk, a seminar uh, with uh, uh, Friedrich Stienfeld. Uh, I would say that he is the most uh, 
uh, experimented the theories uh, in, uh, in diagrammatology and uh, uh, Dario Rodighiero is a young uh, promising uh, scholar uh, who works in Harvard now uh, on uh, uh, visualizations, big data visualization and so on. So if you are interested, Tomorrow at 11, uh, we sent uh, already, Enzo D'Armenio already sent the, the, the link through the semiotics list. So, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you so Ciao. much once again. Ciao.